So um, I am talking today a little bit about edible landscaping. Um, and I love this topic because I think a lot of us are trying to find ways to grow more vegetables, more edibles in our landscape. And I'm gonna keep this really broad um, so that you can make it work wherever your situation is or however your situation is laid out. Um, so that it doesn't matter if you're indoors um, or your balconies, that's all you have, or you have this great vast acreage. Uh, there's lots of things you can do to kind of up your edible landscaping game. Um, and that's the, the purpose a little bit for today. Once again, I'm Cindy Haynes. Um, I'm with Iowa State University Department of Horticulture in the Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist or Consumer Horticulture Extension realm, just like Alicia and Aaron Style, who's also been a uh, presenter on some of this. Some introductions, you know a little bit about me. Um, I love teaching, I love plants, I love talking about plants, um, but I also need to give you some disclaimers on this one. So I am a consumer horticulture extension specialist. Um, I like growing many different types of plants. I like uh, ornamentals as much as I like edibles, but I'm not a designer. So I'm not a landscape designer. I'm not a landscape architect. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about landscape design and landscape architecture in a sense uh, tonight. But I think many of us can appreciate good design um, or at least good design ideas, whether we're a designer or not. So I'm hoping that you'll um, give me a little leeway. And so when we talk about some of these design ideas, you can find a way to make it work in your situation and you can appreciate the beauty in how it was and how it was developed and maintained. My other objective today is to inspire you, to make you think about your garden a little bit differently. And this is the perfect time of year to do that, um, when you can just see the bones of your garden. So to figure out how you want things laid, laid out and then how you want to use edibles to be in some sort of attractive arrangement or uh, attractive combinations so that vegetables aren't always in neat little tidy rows in your backyard um, where you can get, you know, a three foot tiller um, in between them. So I want you to think about that vegetable garden, um, the edibles in your garden, just a little bit differently. And this garden is the one that inspired me to think a little bit differently about it. It's a potager garden that I visited this summer in France. Um, this is a Chateau Villandry in the Loire Valley in France. And this has been a potager or kitchen garden for centuries. Um, there's ornamental gardens here too, but the layout of the kitchen garden is what's so absolutely stunning. This is one square or one piece of that kind of potager garden. Um, and you can see that there's little like raised beds or frames um, where there's lettuce. Um, there's cabbage, uh, maybe along the edge there's celery. Uh, so it's big, nicely arranged clusters of different things, kind of in a square foot garden mentality in these very formal geometric shapes and patterns. And it's using color, it's using texture, it's using all of those good gardening and design practices with vegetables. So who would have thought that you could make vegetables really, really pretty. And some vegetables are gorgeous. At this particular uh, garden, that one square would have been just like one tenth of how big this potager garden is. And what you didn't see in that kind of close up shot are the pear trees that kind of line the entrance or the apple trees or the pear hedges along the edge or the espalier uh, fruits like pear and apple along this particular wall, as well as the roses or the grapes that are on the um, kind of seating places to sit and kind of in the center or these benches. So it's a mix of not only just vegetables, but many other things as well. Um, there's herbs in here like purple basil, there's leeks 
and onions. Um, there's garlic, there's pumpkins. And then along the edges, there's lots of flowers too, uh, for color, um, often edible flowers, and also to attract those pollinators that are so essential in a vegetable garden. So that's what made me think about um, how do we design our landscapes that can be more ornamental as well as edible. So we can turn our ornamental landscape into more of an edible landscape, edible and ornamental uh, landscape. And there's a few things to consider. There's a few components that I think are required um, that I need to review. And I know many of you already know some of these components, but it's important to remember and to remind everyone um, that we need to think about the site. We need to consider a diversity of examples. And then maybe I can show you some of those other design ideas that might inspire you to try something a little different. First up is right plant, right place. And this often starts with considerations of your site. And this is the perfect time to be out and looking at your site. Go take a look and see um, how much sun it's getting in the winter. Know that it's going to be different in the summer. Uh, in the spring, it's a perfect time to check out your soil to make sure it's well drained. Uh, maybe you think about um, the bones that are around or how that particular location connects to the house. And as far as scale wise, um, is it big or is it small? So there's lots of things to think about when you just have the bare minimum and that's what we often get in the winter. When you are able, um, to think about this from the spring, summer, and fall, the growing season, that's when you know what kind of light and soil conditions you have. And when we're talking edible landscaping, we're primarily talking full sun. We're primarily talking well-drained soils. There are a few exceptions, and I'll mention one or two, but to really do edible gardening well, we need as much sun as possible, um, and we need a good, well-drained soil. Um, so that's kind of essential. So think about that. Find those locations that are at least six or eight hours of direct sunlight a day that have really good, well-drained soils. If you don't have that, no worries. There's lots of things that you can do instead. Like this particular garden center um, has containers where they're growing kale, edible flowers like pansy, as well as parsley and maybe a few other things kind of tucked in here. I've seen Swiss chard in here before. These are just big container gardens that produce a lot of product, a lot of produce um, that you can use in your home, salads or cooking um, throughout the spring season. This one was kind of their spring uh, show. And then to make it really attractive, they put some ornamentation in here, which they could use later for growing a cucumber, um, or maybe a, a snap pea or a, some sort of pea or bean kind of over that um, in the container as well. When you're thinking about your space, think about um, the amount of space that you have. Um, that often helps determine what you can put into uh, your container. You can be highly selective and we'll talk about um, other things and other places and how much a mature size uh, becomes really important. But there are compact types of some things. There are dwarf types of other fruits and vegetables. So you can finagle this just a little bit and be okay. Um, sometimes in containers, I put things a little closer together and that's okay in containers, but be careful in doing this um, in the landscape or in other locations where you don't have good airflow because then it usually leads to disease issues or other problems. And then finally, when you're looking at these bones of your landscape, think about the function. What do you want this space to do for you? So maybe it was always beautiful and attractive. You just wanna add some edibles to it. So maybe it's just a few containers here or there, or maybe it's a, a tomato here, a tomato there. Um, and finding great ways to make it look good uh, throughout the season. So think small and be very targeted, especially your first year or two of kind of thinking about your garden and landscape from this perspective. 
there are a lot of plant examples that we're going to talk about. Um, that's what I am as a horticulturist. I'm also going to ask for some examples, plant examples from you as well um, in the chat. But when I think about plants for this style of gardening or in this kind of realm of gardening, it's always about a combination of plants. It's a layered look. It's uh, using what you have in the space you have to be as efficient and as edible as possible. So there's trees in this edible uh, landscaping. There are shrubs, there's vines in certain locations, there's perennials, there's annuals, and there's herbs. There's this combination of all of them working uh, together. There's even some of those vegetables and herbs in um, the containers as well. So here's an ornamental cabbage, uh, which is also edible and does pretty well. There's uh, some chard in here and an ornamental pepper. And believe it or not, there's a little of a variegated corn kind of growing in the back behind this as well, as well as a mum and some other things kind of tucked into this fairly large container. And here's an ornamental pepper um, tucked in with the other annuals. Uh, these ornamental peppers are a little different. They're very hot. So this one was used as an edible hot pepper as well as an ornamental pepper. And then we have some, uh, actually some edible flowers along the back as well. When we're talking trees and shrubs, um, I have to mention a particular style of gardening or maintenance of some trees or shrubs called espalier. Um, this is very labor intensive. Uh, but very beautiful and a great way to really pack in a lot of trees um, in a fairly small space. This is also a great way to utilize maybe your microclimates that you have um, in your garden uh, to grow some of those trees that maybe are a little bit more marginal. Um, this is a spalier, I think uh, pear trees kind of all lined up together. Um, there is a trellis system helping to support them um, because this one's not along a wall. Sometimes they are on a trellis system near a wall or a building or a fence. And the objective of this particular espalier is to make it a living fence or a screen. Um, so how many hedges do you have that actually produce pears or fruit as well? So it's a really good idea for utilizing this space and making it productive. Um, and beautiful as well. Some of the trees that you should also consider, even if you don't espalier them, um, you can think about apples and pears um, almost all over uh, the U.S. If you have a, a smaller space, think about plums. Um, those are actually really nice and beautiful um, as well. So pick a couple of different cultivars, have a couple of different types of these, uh, fruit trees in your landscape, um, and then you have really good cross-pollination. You've got cherries, you've got lots of options uh, for fruit trees to have in your landscape. They take some space, um, but one or two or three of them are usually really productive um, and usually beautiful in bloom and then beautiful in fruit as well. Select wisely on cultivars when we're talking fruit trees. So you want something that's disease resistant in your area. So check with your county extension office to find those that work well in your region that have some disease resistance so that your maintenance um, and spraying and if that's needed um, is really uh, low or non-existent. There's also another plant hidden in here um, because I don't want us to forget about some of those smaller uh, trees that do produce edible fruit, and one of my favorites is serviceberry or juneberry. This is an amelanchier that produces a little blueberry-like fruit. It's a really seedy blueberry, but it's nice, makes great muffins. Um, I never get enough for a pie, uh, but wonderful muff muffins and pancakes, and I will battle some of the birds uh, for these uh, little berries. They're nice, tasty treats in June, late May, early June, and well worth it. And I love this particular tree. It's a large shrub or small tree 
um, because it can be multi-stemmed or single stemmed. It's got beautiful flowers in the spring and then gorgeous fall color. So it really does that kind of multi-season interest in the landscape. In the edible landscape, shrubs uh, have a lot of power as well. Um, they take a lot of space, but they can be incredibly productive. And sometimes in that edible landscape, some of these roots that we get from shrubs are really expensive. So um, having some that you're growing and finding a way to kind of preserve those can really help reduce uh, that grocery bill as well. There's uh, the assorted berries here, um, blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries. Uh, we don't grow sometimes the best blueberries in Iowa because we don't have soils that are that low in pH, so we have to amend to get them, but it's worth it um, if you can kind of amend the soils and you can have a blueberry patch or blueberries in a raised bed um, because they're so tasty and so nutritious and beautiful shrubs as well. But don't forget about some of the others that you might see too. Um, black raspberries I see in the woods behind my house and I love them. And while they're a little unruly, there are ways to kind of contain them uh, with some trellising systems and then maybe putting some other things in front of them uh, to kind of hide some of those unruly uh, stems or canes. And then gooseberries. Who would have thought gooseberries? Gooseberries are a wonderful small shrub, hardy to a fault thorny, so very few things actually bother it, um, and pretty and highly edible and make the best jellies and jams, um, especially if you like it a little on the tart side because they have a light, a light kind of tart taste as well, or you just add more sugar. And then finally, don't forget those other edible plants, those other shrubs like roses. Believe it or not, um, this has beautiful flowers, pink flowers, and this particular rugosa rose um, in the spring. And then it produces this wonderful fruit or hip. They call them hips. And this is really um, highly packed with vitamin C, uh, makes a great tea, um, and makes for some other kind of jellies and jams, you can use it um, as well. So there's some unusual ways to use some of these other shrubs out there too. And then this is the one time I'll mention another shrub that I like in the edible landscape um, that's pretty. It also produces some unusual fruit and that's elderberry. It's another one that's, um, you have to contain it sometime in Iowa, but that fruit is great for jams and jellies and syrups, um, as well as being uh, very attractive, as well as being um, great for uh, wildlife as well. So think about um, even those kind of unusual ones that maybe weren't your first choice, but in finding ways to make them work in your landscape. And I like elderberry as well because I can put it in some shade and it will still do well and it will still be pretty productive. Not too many fruiting shrubs like too much shade and still are highly productive. There are vines out there too that you can consider. Um, there's this one is grape, of course. You can pick grapes based on how you want to use them. Uh, if you want to make your own wine or just make uh, jams and jellies or just have table grapes uh, because you just want to have some grapes in the season. It's all up to you. This is a very vigorous vine. So it needs usually a nice structure, a pergola, a bench, something trellising. Um, don't go small. Uh, with this one because you usually get several feet of vine growth a year. This particular vine will require some pruning to keep it productive. Uh, we do a lot of pruning on grapes because we want to limit the actual uh, number of size of fruits or clusters so that those berries tend to be a little larger, a little sweeter, a little tastier. Okay, um, So it's a nice one. Uh, to consider. You also have some other unusual ones too. The one I like to mention because it's attractive is a hardy kiwi. It's the one here on the left. Um, the new growth, the leaves on those look like they've been dipped in kind of a pink or pale pink uh, paint. So something a little bit different. It does produce a little tiny kiwi-like fruit. 
I will tell you this one has grown more for ornamentation, at least in Iowa, than being productive for fruit. But it's kind of fun to have one or two bite-sized kiwis um, a year on this particular vine. Also needs some uh, some structure, some nice structure uh, to grow on as well. Perennials, I think about some perennials like strawberries uh, are great ones in the um, vegetable garden. There are some unusual strawberries that you can consider as well. There's even perennial strawberries that produce nice flower and very few uh, fruit. Um, mixing strawberries is also sometimes a good idea. Having a dedicated space for those June bearing strawberries so you have nice production that you can then preserve as well as having um, hanging baskets of ever bearing or day neutral strawberries. So you still have a few strawberries that you can harvest uh, throughout the growing season for cereal um, or for other just snacking while you're around the garden. This is also where a lot of herbs uh, become pretty important. This is onion chives. I love onion chives, um, not only because they have nice tasty flowers as well as leaves, but I can use them in a lot of these kind of edible landscaping ideas as borders. They make a nice little small size. Um, I can make a nice line of them so they can kind of create an edge or a border that I can then grow some other things in it. And chives are tough enough to take it um, and come back year after year after year. I will tell you that my trick though is usually to use onion chives and not garlic chives um, because I can kind of contain the onion chives a little bit uh, better. The garlic chives are always receding and becoming a weed everywhere um, in my garden. If you're not up for that, if it, that's a little too unruly even for you, you can think about tail lilies as an edging uh, for some of us. It gives you that grass-like effect um, and the daylily flowers are edible as well. They kind of taste like buttered lettuce. Sounds weird, but tasty on a salad, believe it or not. Um, put ranch dressing on anything, and I can even get my 15-year-old to eat it. There are lots of annuals in this mix, and this is where most vegetables uh, realm lie in, are all the different types of annuals that you can use. So we think about tomatoes. Um, this is one called green zebra. We think about the leafy greens. This is a type of kale. Um, there's some sage as an herb here too, uh, which is a perennial in Iowa. Um, but there's also annual flowers that I like to include here too. Um, in creating some of these designs, I like to use this little signet marigold once again as a little edging. It's an annual that I can grow that stays really compact. I don't have to prune it to maintain it. Um, it does that little perfect mounding that I want. And then I can just go out and harvest a few flowers because it's a really wonderful edible flower. The signet mar marigold is a little lemony, so it's not as potent as a typical marigold, so it's a little bit better. Um, and also, once again, attracts a lot of pollinators to my garden. I'm going to give you one more slide of annuals, and then I'm going to ask you to input into the chat some other types of plants that you would include in your edible landscape, um, whether it be some native plants, uh, trees, shrubs, vines, perennials, or annuals. So start typing some of that into the chat, um, and we'll take a look at some of those as well. This is another collection of annuals that I'd like to mention. Once again, the ornamental peppers, the hot peppers, bell peppers, Peppers are beautiful plants, and there's lots of them that have um, very colorful fruit um, that uh, span the whole spectrum of that Scoville scale. So you can find a pepper that you like, one that's not hot to one that's super hot. Um, this one is a pretty hot one. Uh, it's a smaller pepper. It's considered an ornamental edible pepper, um, but if you like hot peppers, you don't need very many of these. To kind of achieve that goal um, or to create different jams or jellies um, or sauces um, as well. And then on the other side of this slide is basil. Who can say no to basil? You've got to have basil. 
um, in your garden. And this is a fantastic one with other ornamentals. Um, it likes it sunny. It likes it hot. It likes it on the dry side. So it likes a little bit of that neglect. So it's perfect in containers on your front doorstep. It's perfect um, where you would have had annuals um, before because there's purple foliage basil. There's Thai basil that has nice flowers as well. So lots of options when you're thinking about basil and lots of ways to use it um, as an edible annual herb. And then in the center is chard, Swiss chard. And I don't know that I've ever seen an edible landscape, an ornamental edible landscape that didn't include chard. Swiss chard comes in gorgeous colors, red, yellow, pink, white, um, these gorgeous stems, these petioles that really are attractive, produce nice foliage that is edible um, and can stand and withstand a lot of different kinds of conditions uh, throughout uh, the season. I sometimes also use beet greens as well as a replacement when I'm uh, thinking about another ornamental. And there's a couple of beet greens um, that produce burgundy foliage that I really love too. And then underneath this chart, kind of rambling all over, um, is a sweet potato vine. Um, this is an ornamental sweet potato vine, but if you will notice, there are some new sweet potatoes that are truly produce nice sweet potatoes that actually have more ornamental foliage as well. So um, think about even sweet potatoes, even the ones that aren't colorful uh, foliage, because they are beautiful leaves, even if they're green. So with that, I'm going to stop for just a second and talk about what's in the chat and what I'm seeing in the chat. And there's some wonderful ideas out there, lots of edible flowers, like nasturtiums, um, lots of uh, herbs like uh, fennel, chia. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, that's one of them. Um, you can think about two cucumbers. I'll show you cucumbers on the next slide. Thimble berries. There's a lot of unusual kind of brambles and berries out there that you might want to try. Peanuts are a great idea. Long season crop. We barely make it sometimes in Iowa uh, for peanuts, but it's fantastic. Pansies. Oh, ginger. We're getting into some tropical plants that some of you are considering. Asparagus, always good. Peas, hazelnut. Hazelnut's a really wonderful shrub um, that produces a nice nut. Sweet potatoes. We've got runner beans. Yep. And carrots. You've got it. And even sunflowers. So good. And honeyberry. Lots of good ideas in the chat. Uh, so take a look at some of those oops, ideas in the chat. I don't know what happened there. Let's go back to this slide. And I'll focus on if you're thinking about some of these annual vegetables in a more edible ornamental landscape, you need to think about maintenance. Um, you need to think about some of that support uh, for some of them like cucumbers and tomatoes because they get big and unruly and then they sprawl everywhere. And unless you're using them as a ground cover, it becomes kind of an ugly mess. Um, so think about trellis systems like you see uh, with the cucumbers over here or even panels that you can have your tomatoes grow up and over that help support some of that fruit. Um, and then this is a, a hydroponic technique where they're growing tomatoes on twine or wires. Um, and this is great because you can kind of add more and lift it up and down. So it's kind of interesting. Look up hydroponic tomatoes and how they grow them. So you can grow these tomatoes very vertically as well as making them a nice screen for a patio or a porch. So it's a really good um, idea. So think about how you're gonna support them. You can also have a lot of fun with this. I, I love the spiral stakes for some things. Um, you can make really unusual um, artistic sculptures that might work really well uh, for your landscape too. Mm -hmm. 
So with the containers, you also have um, some other things to think about. In most edible landscapes often include containers in many different areas. Um, it's often a backup. You can use these containers in certain spots. You can use these containers on patios or decks. And then you can find plants like patio tomatoes that will work really well um, here, as well as um, herbs or um, even some of those edible flowers. Regardless of where you put your plants, whether in containers or in the landscape, be sure to read the label, know something about that mature size. Um, I think the only time we kind of keep things a lot smaller is when we're espaliering something so we make it a little bit smaller, but otherwise it usually reaches its mature size. And maybe that means it's a patio tomato that goes into the container instead of a big sprawling indeterminate type tomato. Also consider maintenance requirements. Um, some things will need staking, some things will need fertilizing, some things will need regular harvesting to kind of keep them productive. So know a little bit about what you're growing and you can make it ornamental, but you wanna make it productive. And then with using some of those vegetables in a more um, ornamental landscape or an edible landscape, you need to think about what you're going to do next. So what happens when you harvest the chard? What's going to be planted there next? So what takes over that space? Maybe it's a container uh, for a little while, or maybe it's a second sowing of a yellow wax bean uh, that will come up pretty quickly. Or it's a, a set of radish that you kind of create a line um, so you can have another harvest fairly quickly. So make that plan for uh, what to do next. And then map this out. Um, you might like Swiss chard always as a line kind of at the, towards the front steps, but rotate it. Um, maybe it's, it's uh, chives one year and maybe it's chard the next year, or maybe it's a little, um, little dwarf basils uh, for edging the next year or that signet marigold. So, continually think about rotating your crops, um, especially in these kind of ground beds, because that's good practice in your vegetable garden and that's still good practice in your edible landscape. So I'm gonna show you a few design ideas um, that we, uh, you can see as you kind of travel around the world, um, as well as throughout uh, the US, and I'm gonna point out a few of the features that really struck me about these design ideas. You can also type into the chat if there's some things that really strike you in some of these pictures, or this would be a great idea, or I like this, um, I like that. Um, because I think we often learn from each other as we're going through this as well. So first, I'm, I've got a typical uh, raised bed in a um, typical landscape. And this uh, raised bed has some nice fencing around the edge. It's got a teepee in the center where it's growing um, some scarlet runner beans. It's got some chard. It's got some broccoli in here too. And it's got a mix of different flowers, edible flowers that kind of are grow growing with it. Um, this is kind of a more formal layout with a more kind of cottage or informal planting on the inside. And this works really well uh, for home landscapes. So we kind of create this square container, maybe it's next to a couple of other square or round containers with walks and spacing kind of in between. And then we just kind of pack it in uh, with a lot of different types of plants and it makes it work. So you just call it a cottage style um, edible landscape. You can also do a little bit more with this. Um, you can have a few things spilling out of the edge or you can kind of create some more formality or geometric shapes as well. So here's another uh, home garden that has created raised beds, fairly simple raised beds in a nice little area. It's surrounded by a fence and a hedge, so it's somewhat protected from those rabbits. Um, and then they did some nice things with what they planted um, in them. 
So this one has a container maybe of some petunias kind of spilling over it. And maybe it's got some uh, leafy greens along the sides or maybe even a pumpkin, a couple of pumpkins that you can plant here. Um, you have some parsley on the ends of this one. And then you have some lettuce in the center kind of creating these kind of triangles. Um, so we're thinking a little more geometrically. We're thinking about the difference in colors. We're thinking about the difference in textures. And this is what helps make it fairly ornamental really quickly and still equally as successful. You can even think about these little raised bed containers almost like a quilt block. Who knew? So you can kind of create these half square triangles or four triangles in one area with different cultivars of lettuce. Keep it simple, but you can have a lot of fun with it um, as well. Sometimes you set up the landscape, um, the design, the borders, the edge, the repetition that you see in really good design from the very beginning. And this is what this um, does as well. So it's a little more expensive, um, but it's created these kind of raised beds uh, with rock and there's stone in between. And then we have these nice trellis systems in the center that are repeated on either side. It all matches the front entrance or the back entrance. I'm not sure what, what this is um, and kind of creates this very cohesive um, landscape. And then to make it edible, it's just filled with things um, that we can eat. So we have lots of kale, we have lots of parsley, uh, maybe we have some carrots in here as well. Um, and then it's all kind of planted in this kind of very formal mirror images on either side to kind of continue that repetition um, and still be incredibly attractive and probably really productive. And this doesn't have to be a hard thing. Um, lettuce is often uh, one of those easy uh, ornamental edibles that we could grow. And this is just using lettuce in a bed that would normally, we would normally plant um, annual flowers like petunias. And instead in spring, think about the uh, ornamental lettuce and having some kind of burgundy or red lettuce with some green lettuce. And then as you harvest these, um, after these different shapes, maybe you harvest the corners first, you plant pansies in it or that signet marigold because um, it's going to get hot and maybe that lettuce won't like uh, the summer heat. So you change it out and maybe there's a ring of Swiss chard that comes back in the fall. So you can constantly think about how this evolves and how this changes and still be really attractive as well as something you can harvest and eat. Sometimes the structure is really important. And I love this one because it's the trellis system that's already set up. In between these uh, two kind of arches are wires so that tomatoes can grow up through them. So it becomes that tomato steaks that are perfect. Um, you also might try and grow um, vines along these edges too. This would be a great place for cucumbers. Uh, to grow one year as well. And then here's the basil again, or another type of herb. This looks like Thai basil um, at the bottom, kind of planted um, all along, and then raised beds all around um, this particular um, archway, which I think is gorgeous. Texture is important, and we don't think about vegetables as having differences in texture but they're really pretty good. Um, chives have very linear grass-like uh, leaves. Lettuce, chard have really big, bold leaves. And then we get the colors as well. And here's some marigolds planted in here. And then we get the fine texture maybe of parsley or fennel or dill. So you can add all of those things into it. Um, and when you had contrast those textures, then it becomes something special um, to look at. I will tell you to plan this out, to spend a little time thinking about your plan for your garden, because there'll be spaces where you want 
uh, permanent plants like those trees and shrubs and perennials. So you wanna make sure you have plenty of space for that apple tree or that pear tree. Maybe you have enough space for three or four blueberries or raspberries, and then plan those places where you might have tomatoes one year and then tomatoes in containers the next year. Um, and then a little strips of where you can tuck in things like kale um, or calendula um, or squash. So everything you can think about, you can kind of find a way to kind of fit it in uh, as long as it's meeting those requirements that it needs. And this is not something that we only get to do in certain areas of the country. We can do this anywhere. Um, vegetables grow pretty well in many different parts of the U.S. And this is a Chicago garden. This was in Midwest Living, living and I love it because there's the vegetable garden that's fairly formal. It's got some boxwood hedges in there um, to kind of create that formality. It's got the trellises and the structures. It's got the fence around it, and then it's got a big, huge perennial border um, all around it as well to track some of those pollinators. A great place to kind of sit in the back too. Another inspiration garden and one of the last uh, slides I'll show you um, tonight is Barnsley House and Gardens. This is in England. This is in the Cotswolds. And I visited this garden as a graduate student many years ago. I won't tell you how many years ago. Um, but this is an aerial view of the Pottinger Garden there. And it's laid out in very geometrical uh, lines and spaces. It has very formal plantings in it. Uh, there are rose trees, little rose lollipops here. Um, there are containers of mums in the fall. Um, and then in those spaces in between, where it's in between the bricks or the walking paths, um, is packed full of different vegetables. And it's all about being as productive as possible. These walkways are pretty narrow um, because Rosemary Veery was pretty narrow and could do these walkways. She maximized the space uh, to grow the vegetables, but it was gorgeous. It was always gorgeous. And several different successions of plantings would happen in some of these uh, spaces uh, throughout the year. So highly productive as well. And then one of my last slides is to remind you that there's some other really good references out there. Uh, Rosemary Veery, this is an old book. Um, she has some uh, good planting plans on how to design a landscape. And this ornamental vegetable garden is what it was called uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So it's been, it's been a little while, but it was pretty amazing what she has done with it. And you can still find um, this book or references to it. More recently, um, Rosalind Creasy, who's on the West Coast, uh, has some great ideas on how to combine plants and think about that edible landscape. So you can turn your front yard into a productive edible landscape and still have um, this attractive place that people uh, are welcomed to come and visit uh, you as well. And then even more recently, um, there's a whole foodscape revolution happening. This is Brie Author that's on the East Coast um, and she's growing wheat. She's growing grains um, in her garden as well as all of these kind of ornamental vegetables as well as ornamentals as well. So how, how that's kind of com combining all of these different things to make your garden more productive um, is, is a great idea and great tips on this one too.